That's why you shouldn't listen to people. Yeah. Half the, like 99% of the time, you give them a, you give them a once over, you glance at them and you, you ask if you should listen to this person or not. Yeah. Most of the time though. I most agree. Most of the time, probably not. Yeah. Most of the time, definitely not. Yeah. It's fucking like up. for example, like if, uh, if Sisters 55 was walking in right now, <laughs> I'd, I'd give him a once over and I'd be like, I got to listen to this guy. I got to listen to this guy. This is a well put together guy. The beard's a good choice. Yeah, I was thinking about that yesterday. Choice. I didn't say it. The beard. Yeah, the beard's a great yeah. choice. You look really good with the beard. Get in here. Oh, nice. Get in here right now. Sit in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we decided we decided to do a cold open in this style. I want to say I kind of prefer that. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can you can do that. We'll just keep going. No, that's okay. I don't want the possibility of anything getting picked up on the mic to uh, happen. <laughs> <laughs> how's it going <laughs> going good how's the walk here that was good i went to that um the cafe nearby agenda and i was like working on stuff golden wheat no 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 it's it's a little bit further down agenda you don't know oh it's a gen no it's agenda it's another cafe <laughs> <laughs> it's just, nothing really remarkable it's nice sis is 55 <laughs> how's it going on the pod why haven't you killed yourself yet that's a, I mean, that's not a good question. It's <laughs> a, a rough question. Um, do you think I should kill myself? No. It's okay. No, it's an, it's a, well, it's a natural thought everyone has eventually. At some point, crosses your mind. I don't know. Not, I think there's like, there's psychology studies, especially like uh, conservative populations and like, uh, usually like religious people, they tend to not, not experience a lot of like uh, thoughts regarding suicidal ideation compared to the rest of the population. So it depends on how... At least in these studies, it, su it suggests that it's like a really strong worldviews. If they're not like uh, challenged at all, someone could go like their whole life without really, you know, thinking about killing themselves. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. No, I was I thought about giving my dad mushrooms once, and uh, my friend convinced me against it for that reason. Oh, yeah. My, yeah, my dad was like sixty three at the time, and he was like, "If you give your imagine like your worldview being shattered in your sixties," mm -hmm. and I was like, "You're right. I'm not gonna try to give my dad mushrooms." Mm -hmm. Cause that would suck. That'd be horrible. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's good. Like, it depends on what your dad is like. But if they're like very rigid in their ways, and uh, he, he he was he was a rigid guy. Yeah, very steadfast. But it yeah. worked for him. Oh, it did. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, it worked well. Yeah, hmm. yeah who? I mean, you never know how how people will react. I guess to uh, to psychedelics. Sisyphus did a classic Sisyphus maneuver. He wriggled out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sisyphus, you have, a, you have an excellent way of when you're asked this targeted question, yeah. you abstractify. Yeah. You and the like 30 hot chicks on your podcast talking about love. You like talking, <laughs> there's always this like sexual tension. And you manage to make it ab so abstract. It's like, what are they even talking about anymore? Clearly, they're actually talking about the fact that there's they want to make out right now. Oh, wow. This on is, the pod. This is really. Uh... I don't know, we'd get why haven't this. you killed yourself? <laughs> I want to know. Why do you think I haven't killed myself? I really, I don't know. I don't know why I haven't killed myself. I don't know why he hasn't killed himself. What gets you up in the morning? What gets me up in the What's morning? What's your pursuit? Hmm. I do like just like learning things, like learning about myself and like other people. I feel like, because I feel like there's like a really intense relationship between curiosity and passion. And when you're like curious about things, you're like passionate about them. And then passion is such a, just like, innate feeling to have that kind of justifies existence like you can't be pa i mean you could be passionate about something so much that you kill yourself but that's like kind of in the service of some larger idea so it's like it's not that sort of like i guess uh i don't know it was like fenon but there's like some oh uh durkheim i think ta or someone that that based their work off durkheim talked about like reactionary suicide um which is just like killing yourself out of despair out of almost like a lack of passion or like apathy or something mm. and yeah because i'm reading the book like uh revolutionary suicide by one of the co-founders co of the black panthers and he talks about like people can kill themselves out of a lot of passion mm. also but it's more of like an instrumental uh cause so it's like i guess when you're asking me that you're specifically talking about reactionary suicide why haven't i killed myself out of like a a lack of passion or like out of like a confrontation with like despair or something like that well it's more of a broad question but yeah that's okay. that's, a, that's a fair that's a fair interpretation okay. when you say that it makes me think of like the monks lighting themselves on fire yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. because there are you could argue that there are uh, like different 
reasons why people like kill themselves um you could make the further argument that like everybody at the end of the day is just still just killing themselves out of some like even the higher ideas that they're i think i because i I thought about that a lot if i was one of those monks lighting myself on fire i would make up some excuse (laughs) (laughs) like if they were actually just depressed yeah i mean like i'm a monk i'm not getting laid i don't know (laughs) just douse myself in gasoline this is to protest the Chinese government. Whoosh. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I mean, something pathological is going on there. Yeah, I always wonder, the, the, the monks, I feel like the monks that light themselves on fire, the self-immolation, that's like scary because I don't understand, like, what's the difference between life and death in their worldview? Like, in, in their experience, what separates life and death for them? If death is so, if death is so easily chosen... You know what I mean? Hmm. Like, they're just like, oh, I'll just do this. And I'm like, I'm going to react. I'm not even going to react to it. Like, they're so, they're so mindful that they can just not even experience the pain or experience the pain hmm. from like a third party. When you meditate, right? And you, and you feel experience from like outside of yourself. Like when you, if you're sad and then you meditate while you're sad, you can see the sadness, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like you're experiencing that you're not identifying with sadness. You're just like watching sadness mm-hmm. and they're like watching pain mm-hmm. and they're like killing themselves. Right? So it's like, why, I don't know. Why, why have they maintained being alive at all? Why didn't they kill themselves when they're like, when they came, when they became enlightened, when they were like 30 or something, they've been meditating for, meditating for like 10 years. Mm. Why wait? I'm sure that they were in a lot of pain, actually. No, I just want to put that out there. They were definitely in a lot of pain. But it was no way they were like, I'm viewing this from a third party. They're probably like, ah, my flesh! I need that. I mean, they weren't identifying. Oh no, have you seen the video of the, the one that just sits there? That's what I'm thinking. Of right. specific, I'm thinking of a specific video. That whole time he's just saying, "Keep it together, holy shit! Ah, <laughs> keep it together. This can look so cool." Like, like he just sits. Like he doesn't. He doesn't move. And he just like collapses. Like dies. No, nah, I don't believe it. He probably was selling like a bunch of heroin. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are the other kinds of suicide? Reactionary suicide is opposed to what? Um, well, liberal suicide. <laughs> up top. Hey, up top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the only dichotomy I can think of right now is reactionary to revolutionary because oh. there's like, I don't know. What is revolutionary suicide? Uh, revolutionary suicide is, uh, um, Huey Newton. That's it's, it's his idea of basically like you aren't doing things. It's not like a death wish, but you are okay with accepting death because like the cause that you're going forward with is like, it's, it's so life affirming that like to live, without these sort of values or without like, or with these like certain needs being denied is basically mm. a life like not worth living. Mm. So it's completely worth it to at least risk um, like losing your life, like going forward to try to like have these values in place. Yeah. Like, which, which is like how the blood, that was the black Panthers kind of whole motive. And they were, that's why they were a lot more militant was because like, there were just like basic things that the government was doing to black people and also like taking from black people that they were like, okay, I'm willing to like literally die over this. Mm. Like at the end of the day, because it's like our lives are so shit in these conditions right. that like, so it's, so it's, yeah, it's like ideological, I guess, if, if you wanted to be like cynical because it's like purporting certain values. All right. We we're, we're starting to make a, a suicide quad here. We've got revolutionary <laughs> suicide, reactionary suicide. What happens when you just kill yourself? Cause you're, I don't know, sad, well, that would be reactionary. Suicide. That's reactionary. Yeah. What if you kill yourself because you're happy? Because you're happy. Yeah. What if you're like it's not getting better than this? Like like somebody overdosing, like a hedonist or something. Sure. Hmm. Um. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess. Uh, By the way, mm-hmm. when we get to twenty seven, <laughs> throwing he, floating, floating that out there. Also making a pact right now. Depends okay. on how how well you guys are doing. I'll get there first. So yeah. Yeah. Wait, how old are you? I'm 25. Okay, okay. You're... 26. 26. 26. Okay. How old are you? Four. I'm 25. Four okay. more months. <laughs> Four more months. Wait, when's your birthday? April 1st. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very unique. Mm-hmm. April oh. fucking 1st. Yeah. You have a lesbian flag behind you. <laughs> Would you identify as a male lesbian? If, if other people want me to identify as a male lesbian. Define uh, male lesbian. What does male lesbian yeah. mean to you? <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess it's like there's that, that Drake lyric. Like, uh, she says I'm lesbian, girl me too, or something like that. <laughs> I guess I guess that's where it would have came from. But, hmm. Yeah. Why do you have a lesbian flag behind you? Oh, we, we, we had a, we, I had a Barbie themed birthday party and, um, the dollar store was closed. So we had to find like other pink things around like 8 PM and I live in the village. So, 
um, there was a flag store with like a lot of different flags and my lesbian friend actually picked out the lesbian flag mm. and it was a good choice because it's an extremely pink flag. Yeah. And then I just found it, you know, it's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I do, I do like to just like put things in videos that just, there's no real reason for them being there, but then people like talk about it. Mm. Um, free engagement. Yeah, at the end of the day, it drives clicks, drives True. traffic. So. Yeah. Right, yeah. it's all part of Sisyphus's power games. <laughs> <laughs> Sisyphus is reading the Forty Eight Laws of Power. What do you think about the Forty Eight Laws of Power? Um, I, I haven't read it. I know that it's the most checked out book in um, prisons. Yes. Also, what do you? It's also one of the top. Uh, it's the best selling book on Amazon right now. All too. time. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. what do you what do you make of all that? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, like it's, it's kind of like Machiavellianism or yeah. it's like manipulation techniques. Yeah. Um, I got a copy up there. Oh yeah, you, you do. We can pull it down <laughs> along with Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, hold on. Um, He's also got <laughs> infinite jest and, uh, and Mark Fisher books. Uh, Zizek and Zizek. Oh, I actually got an email from Zizek today too. Oh, you really? Email from yeah, Zizek? yeah. Cause I emailed him to ask him for, a for, a. If he could contribute to this this video I'm making, and he gave me the most Zizek response, he said, um, "Okay, so if this is going to read an email from Slavoj Zizek oh, awesome. out loud, awesome." So I said, "Hello, I am Ben, um, and I have a YouTube channel that deals with philosophy, psychology, um, and I'm currently working on a video series that discusses the revolutionary potential of politics online. I would greatly appreciate any opportunity to interview you or hear of your views on the online left, deference, politics, surplus enjoyments. Um, please let me know. And he responded within four minutes and he said, honored by your invitation, but terribly sorry, am old and tired, cannot any longer do such things. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Did you send him Noam Chomsky as a hundred year old man going like, well, the thing about <laughs> online politics. He's old and tired and won't do interviews anymore. Uh, I don't know. Maybe just right now he's old and tired. That's a that's a great that's a great no answer. Yeah, that's like an awesome no. I would frame <laughs> yeah. that no answer. Yeah. Like if someone told me no like that, I would be totally I have no hard feelings at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Frame frame it like print it out and frame it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Basically, yeah. yeah. My, yeah. E my email from Slava Zizek. <laughs> what I make of the Forty Eight Laws of Power being a uh, success right now is I think people are slightly kind of realizing that things are getting worse. And uh, power is becoming more and more important because you want to be on the top of a hierarchy when things get rough. Like people feel like they don't have a lot of control. Yeah, for yeah. sure. They need defense mechanisms. Yeah. And then, you know, all the shark people are like, well, time to go into shark mode. Yeah. When, sh when stuff goes down, I, I got to make sure I know, you know, how to be on top. <laughs> I think I think it's a bad sign. I think it's a sign that society is. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's rough. ever a good sign when that book is trending. Yeah. It's probably kind of a canary in the coal mine. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah, but I mean, there's also like a trend with uh, like cult books also where um, like like cult books are good because they inform the population on a lot of like manipulation techniques of people that are going to that might end up in a cult. It's a critique. They would know what's going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. But then what ends up happening is that cult leaders will also check out those books. Mm -hmm. And so like there was the like the girl that I was working on that book with who had been involved. Since this is writing a book, by the way. <laughs> and uh, she she actually had the book uh, like from the leader um, because she was working closely with this guy. And the book was about cults. And it was like mm -hmm. it was like a it was like talking about how bad cults are and like all of their manipulation techniques. And you could see the leader. He had like left sticky notes and like highlighted mm. all of the first half of the book. Mm. And it's because the second half deals with the consequences. Of right. cults. <laughs> yeah. And it's like all of like, you know, what happens to the victims and the trauma. And uh, he just like didn't care about that at all. He just learned all of the interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's fascinating because like um, Machiavelli, the prince People say that was written as an act of satire mm. and it doesn't matter what the guy's intention was. It's been used as an instruction manual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you can you can argue however you'd like about the author's intention, but depending on how just like what's what's the the public impact mm -hmm. or like the cult, the cultural impact of the work. Um, that's that, why it's hard to define it. like irony sometimes because you're, you're trying to wonder, do we look at it from the author's intent or do we look at it from how it was interpreted? Mm -hmm. And then who is to even say how it was interpreted? Maybe there are some people who are like reading Machiavelli and they're like, ah, great satire, good satire. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. What's it's complicated. the evidence of, uh, of the prince being satire? I don't know. I guess people say it's satire. I mean, like people were like, I think it's in contrast with some of his other work that like doesn't seem to align with, uh, with what he was saying. And he had some sort of like um, personal grievances with 
uh, like other political figures at the time where it almost seemed like he was like actively kind of poking at them. Mm. But I don't really, yeah, I don't quite remember. This was like, we read this like a long time ago. But yeah, it doesn't matter historically speaking because everybody refers to it as, yeah. I mean, there's a psychological disorder called yeah. Machiavellianism. So part, right. of the, part of the dark triad. Yeah. Mm. CGP Grey has a video on rules for rulers and mm. it's basically a Machiavellian sort mm. of video and it explains what you have to do. And it's obviously a critique, but someone could easily just take notes, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like, you know, send the general in to do the dirty work and then kill the general, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Um, the problem is one of the 48 laws of power should be never be seen reading the 48 laws of power. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty, pretty cringe. <laughs> yeah. Pretty cringe. That's also rule number 50, never look at a picture of Robert Greene. <laughs> never look, never look at what he looks like. The, the physiognomy is all off. <laughs> Don't take advice from that guy. That's why we were talking before you came in. We were talking mm -hmm. about how, how long you, have you guys been recording? So it's 10 minutes. Like, okay. <laughs> no. this is, maybe this is like a four hour podcast <laughs> and I'm at the end of it. Uh, we were talking about how you should never, um, you should just like give someone a once over before you listen to them. Look at the life they're living instead of just like, like judge a book by. Yeah. By like do a little bit of book judging cover. Yeah. <laughs> cover, cover a judging book. You should a little bit. Yeah. But it, some people just give off a stench of unhealthiness though. Yeah. Even if it's not like very apparent like you can just tell. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some people. Well, I think it's less like we should. I just, I don't think we're like capable of not doing that. Like, I feel like we just naturally. I, I feel like sometimes we, we can be a little credulous. Like yeah. someone, someone tells us an idea. Uh, and we're like, oh yeah, so true. I never thought about it like that. But then you look at the guy telling you the idea, like who's who is telling you these opinions about women, right? Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so there's, you can always you can always kind of eke them out and see what's what's going on with them. Yeah. Where, no, no, where no, are no. these ideas coming from? That's like an important aspect of what I'm trying to popularize. Philosophy too, where we uh, improve philosophy. <laughs> That's sequel to good. philosophy. Yeah, that seems like a very philosophical thing to do. We should elect philosophers. Oh God. Yeah. Democratic election, just based it off of like, how whole is this guy or this woman? Are they a whole person? Do they have everything? The, the hierarchy is all checked off and green. Mm. Then you can think about life. You know, and, <laughs> no, and, and Rogan, our chat does not allow you to think about life <laughs> until 40. You're jacked. <laughs> At, no, Renaissance era of Florence. Uh, what? During the Renaissance in uh -huh. Florence, you yeah. weren't allowed to teach unless you were 40. You oh. couldn't teach at university until, unless you're 40 years or older. What do you think about that? It seems kind of authoritarian. Well, yeah, isn't this kind of like the reverse of what a lot of people are arguing about now, which is like there's too many like old people in, in politics and in government. It's like a gerontocracy. 80 is too old. I'm not like 55. <laughs> okay, okay. 55 is a great age right. to teach. I My issue is that like people, because I was doing this with, with, with fine art, where people go to school to teach. Like their career path is like finished high school, finish university, become teacher of university or high school. Mm -hmm. It's like, what have you done in any of those intervals to earn the right to teach people how to live life? Mm -hmm. To be like the second biggest influence on a child's life besides their parents. And all you've done is like study on how to do that. <clears throat> you have no life experience. I think it's a huge issue now. Genuinely. Well, are you talking about like, especially like online content where it's like a lot of people that they, like there's no technically no requirement of like how you can end up being like a self-help guru or like a well i mean both yeah th that definitely and then also like people who act like are career teachers like career professors career teachers in high schools mm -hmm. like you shouldn't be able to be a high school teacher when you're like 24 or like mm -hmm. an elementary school teacher mm. right yeah. you, you should yeah. earn it at least like third there should be like some sort of age requirement just so you like there's a chance you have the experience in life to be a bit wiser but i don't think yeah what do you think about that? I mean, how, how do you define like wisdom? I guess that would be an interesting because 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 maybe it's not really necessarily age, but it's wisdom is the yeah definitely what you're looking for you're looking for wisdom. I guess how how what well, yeah what systems you create to filter in the best teachers mm -hmm. right the best people to hand knowledge down because right now we're doing it wrong. Have you ever wondered if you, if you have autism? <laughs> <laughs> uh, eye contact. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure everybody does at some point. And then especially if you become like super academic, you can, uh, I think one of my professors basically said in a lecture that like most, most of his department he believes is a uh, neurodivergent in some mm -hmm. way, which I kind of wondered what were like the ethics of saying that to a lecture of like 400 kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, if everyone is neurodivergent, is anyone neurodivergent? Yeah. That's the other thing is cause I feel like I meet a lot of people that are neurodivergent and have ADHD and I think it's less like these people are lying or they're just misguided. And it's more like, you know, there's probably a lot of social 
kind of uh, effects of maybe there's like higher i mean there are higher rates of adhd compared to like the 90s and mm -hmm. stuff like that and i mean like you can look at just like social media and um just how information is like consumed and entertainment like mm -hmm. nowadays and like parenting and stuff like ipad babies stuff like that mm -hmm. like makes sense and then also with autism i mean i'm curious the generation like after the pandemic that they mm -hmm. were like on like in online classes mm -hmm. that they you know there was a period of like socio-emotional development that was like stagnant or mm -hmm. at least just like purely digital mm -hmm. and it's like i wonder if if rates of autism will like go up with that specific cohort our chat told me this morning he was like do you think you have autism and then he was telling me about how he did like an online course like test that said yeah. he, had, he, he like get diagnosed immediately <laughs> yeah. what do you make of that if brogan has autism where we all have autism yeah i guess so well, uh, am I well you're, you're you're a very masculine man and there's like a you know jordan peterson would uh would, would agree yeah he would say between, he would say testosterone, testosterone and yeah. autism are linked yeah. and yeah. that that kind of makes sense like what does testosterone do it kind of makes you like well, yeah you, testosterone yeah, yeah it, it literally like i think one of the um effects that like sapolsky talks about is that testosterone does make you i think somewhat worse in recognizing uh the emotions of others mm. or like yeah just yeah emotional recognition like uh in, in social situations, which you could really, that explains a lot of male behavior maybe, but what are your testosterone levels? <laughs> I have no idea. You ever got them tested? No. I, I would assume you're pretty high in testosterone. I, I, would you go to like a doctor or? A, yeah, you get like a blood test. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, no, I haven't, uh, hmm. I haven't got that tested. I got mine done incidentally. For you, other reasons. you have like super high test, don't you? I have, uh, actually I've had, I have high testosterone, but I also have high sex binding globulin. So I have kind of like, like I have like high, but like not, it would be like too high otherwise, which is why I'm bald. <laughs> of course, yeah, you're bald. Yeah. That's, Everyone, why, that's why I got my hood up today. <laughs> it's no just, yeah. it just, <laughs> it's a bad hair day. <laughs> it just happened. Um, uh, I, oh, this is a weird one. Um, I just, we were talking about this before earlier too, like masking specifically because like there, there was the test i was looking at there's a whole database of tests and they're like a lot of them are open psychometrics mm -hmm. and the tests are actual tests used to like see if you should go get professionally assessed mm -hmm. and one of them is about masking it's just like asks you how you learned behaviors and it's like whether it was intuitive or or like analytical so like if you see somebody doing a thing that you want to do like you see someone who is socially like very socially active or like has a lot of women or like a lot of partners and you don't have that and you're like, I want that. And then you like analyze their behavior and then implement it rather than just learning it intuitively. Mm -hmm. And they're saying like, you're autistic if you do the, the analytical thing. Mm -hmm. If you just adopt behaviors that are beneficial to you, like purposefully, like you're like, I'm going to do this, then you do it. Mm -hmm. Where it's like a very rational decision. But that doesn't make any sense because it's like the outcome is the same. Mm -hmm. And then it's also so, it's so idi idiosyncratic. Like it's so personal to do that, that why does it matter how people learn their behaviors? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, when talking about, like, disorders or just, like, any any of these, like, labels, it's, like, you're going to run into a lot of, like, contradictions in terms of, like, defining it. And the only kind of useful, at least for me, the only useful, like, practical definitions is, like, the extent to which they hinder the person's, like, well-being or the end or the well-being of, like, uh, the people around them. Yeah. So it's, like, if somebody's, like, you know, diagnosed as autistic and they're, they're genuinely having trouble getting those outcomes like in terms of like you know pursuing a romantic relationship or like making friends or like um or it's like affecting their work or maybe they don't necessarily feel that but everybody else around them is like oh this is like kind of stressful managing social interactions with this person yeah um then it's like then i think the label becomes a lot more relevant but it's like if you did like an online test and all the psychometrics are right but you're like you you feel comfortable in your life and, and the people around you do then it's like maybe you have it in terms of like the apa was developed for insurance companies to label specific disorders and stuff like that but it's like not really useful beyond that yeah, yeah. makes sense the testosterone video you have, check it out. Says this 55, the myth of testosterone. That was very interesting for me to conceptualize testosterone as sort of being a way of uh, people higher on the hierarchy, just being crueler to the people below them, lower than them on the hierarchy. And uh, I actually started to recognize this with people who were like working for me. They would be like huge suck ups to me. But then like if they perceived someone lower, I'd be like, wow, this person's vicious. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is like a sociopath. I do not want this person working for me. Well, I think with, with testosterone, it's not specifically being like cruel. It's testosterone enhances um, like 
your your interest and motivation to uh, engage in behavior that will help elevate you in the hierarchy. So if you're in a hierarchy that rewards compassion, and I think that's what like Sapolsky talked about, mm. is like a bunch of like high test like Buddhist monks, mm. like they would, you would end up with like this, this class system of like the most compassionate friendly right. monks possible. So it's, it's not necessarily about cruelty. It's your willingness like to that. play the game and we just have cruel games. Exactly. Well, and that's like the larger argument of maybe there's kind of a patriarchal, uh, kind of, uh, elements to, yeah. to our specific hierarchy that rewards aggressive behavior for right. kind of like high testosterone. But if we were to kind of rethink, um, social norms and like how hierarchies are developed and like rewarded more altruistic behavior than male lesbian exactly so that's yeah. what a male lesbian is. <laughs> we figured it out that's that's the trait they breed for in dog fighting is that they don't they don't breed strong dogs that win they bring they breed dogs that keep getting back up mm. what is like they like no matter how beat they are they will just keep going back to try to kill the other dog i feel like i, feel like, worst I feel like they're probably breeding some aggression into if they're killing each other <laughs> I'm sure. Well, yeah, they're breeding, some... but they're not breeding like they're not breeding for like just giant dogs that can like kill really easily. Mm -hmm. they're, because that's a less advantageous trait in dog fighting than just having game. How like, do you just... know this? <laughs> I, I, Is I, that I, why there's that dog fighting thing <laughs> in the backyard? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always meaning to ask about that. I feel like it, it gives the studio kind of a bad vibe. <laughs> the do oh yeah, my dog fighting pen. I forgot. And you're and, like DMing Michael Vick, right? Yeah, my, my, my sign. I signed dog fighting poster. <laughs> yeah, it's all a little uncomfortable. People will have to enter and see that. Yeah. Um, I have to explain it to them. Like, oh no, I just uh, I think it's I think it's novel. It's cool. Do you identify with any uh, DSM five based labels? Do you like any DSM5? of them? Five. I probably had like a. Do I? Well, do I? Like them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that's to, a, a, to a to a certain to a certain extent, am I a all, fan of like some of like them? I I enjoy the word schizotypy. That's a DSM-5 right. label. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it quite a bit. Right. I, I, and at the end of the day, if you're identifying as a depressed person, you kind of like the word depressed. You're a little ego-possessed. A little e Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, do you like... I, I like the word schizotypal. <laughs> do I like... I mean, like, I find some of them interesting. I think disassociative identity disorder is, like, a very interesting one. Um, but I, I wouldn't uh, say I have any, like, personal... Um, you know, experience with that. Of course you wouldn't say you have any yeah, personal but, experience. But maybe my that. other... <laughs> <yeah>. My alters <laughs> might. <laughs> one, of, one of the people up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like, I think that uh, I probably still struggle with, like, some level of, like, social anxiety because um, I think just in generally, like, my family struggles with that. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I think I was, like, from a very young age and I'll still just, like, over, like, little things, like, cashiers just mm. like stuff like that it's 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 really like the initial steps if i go if i'm it's a day where i'm constantly seeing people it's fine mm. but if it's like one interaction in the day that'll like build up a little bit mm. um yeah but beyond that i don't know like i mean in your 20s it's it's natural to like you go through some level of like depression adolescent narcissism is pretty common where, and people will think that they're really narcissistic but it's like it's really just everyone's very self-obsessed in, mm. their, in their early 20s yeah um yeah, like I'm sure there's I mean, and that's the other danger with like learning about personality disorders is like personality disorders are extreme versions of a lot of things that everyone deals with. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to kind of either identify yourself as one of these disorders or like um, you have uh, other people in your life that you think I think it's called like in the same way there's called it's called medical students disorder where like medical students start diagnosing like everyone yeah. in their life every time they learn about symptoms. There's also psychology student disorder, which is like, right. Yeah. It's you can, thing. you can do it. You should know that you should have fun with it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Like you if you're going to, if you're going to identify as borderline personality disorder, have fun with it. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that term before. A like medical student disorder. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you get all these fun little, little tools to play with and then you want to just start using them. Mm -hmm, yeah. When you got all you got is a bunch of hammers, everything looks like nails. I'll do that with dates now. I yeah, like endocrino endocrinology. I'll start like trying to dissect their hormones. What? <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the same vein. It's because uh, of, of being around you. What? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've no. taking like blood tests of your dates. No, you're like oh, you're like a dopamine person. You're like a testosterone person. You're right. an estrogen person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, you do. Like, yeah. like, 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 you like you should people. read "Behave" uh, by Sapolsky because it, it is like a lot about endocrinology and and hormones, and it, he makes it like a lot more confusing and nuanced than like uh, like a lot of people will just assign certain personality traits to to. Right, but I, that's actually exactly why I shouldn't read that book. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, we, if you don't, we, want we, it. we sort of have different approaches. I don't read books. I don't like reading books. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I, reading a book makes you autistic, effectively. 
And the only fun way to do is you, you like, if everyone, if the, if the whole society has a certain conception of dopamine, this is my argument. Mm-hmm. And when we associate dopamine with, I don't know, like reward, right? Mm-hmm. Even though it's actually more like the pursuit of the reward. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you find out it's more about the pursuit of the reward. Every time a, a layman brings up dopamine, you have to say, oh, no, 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 it's actually this. You have to sound like a smart ass. Mm-hmm. Instead, you can take the, the popular idea of what dopamine is and you can play with it like a fun little tool because 10 years later, we're probably going to find out that it's not really just the reward pathway anyway. We're going to find out some other things. Oh, yeah. Are, yeah, I mean, that's the, the really open. boring thing about like anything academic in general that doesn't mm-hmm. translate to any sort of online education is that if you read any paper, like the actual claim of the paper, even if it's like a sociology paper at the end of it, it'll be like, we can't make any claims. And this research requires like future directions. And it's very like unsatisfactory because it's being trying to be, it's trying to be as intellectually honest as possible. Mm. If you're giving it like a, like a, a steel man argument. Right. I know a lot of people have issues with like the replication crisis and stuff, but mm. Mm. whereas online content, it's very like, this is this, and this is the worst yeah. thing. And we're going to run with this definition. And like, I do that. And everyone does because that's yeah. just the nature of it. You can't write like a 17 page academic paper and expect that to uh, uh, do well online. No, we love positing. Yeah, we love positing. It's almost like addictive to posit. Mm-hmm. And then we love consuming other people positing and feeling like everything's clicking into place. The noise has been cut through. We understand everything now. Say things, <laughs> say things, say just say him. Posit, 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 posit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. <laughs> What's the question that you would hate to answer publicly the most. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Go through the list and find the thing and we won't even ask you what what the answer is, mm-hmm. but just say the the least like the the most bad question that you can verbalize. The most bad question. Like the question that you would hate to be asked the most. We won't we won't ask you the answer for it. Hmm. It's an opportunity to be a little aloof and elusive. People will wonder after this podcast, what was the answer to that? Why did they just move on? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know. Like, specifically to me? Mm. I don't know. Like, where were you June 12th? <laughs> like, 2008 or something like that? Mm. Yeah. No, I don't know. Something like, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, there's something like crazy. That. Right. I don't know. I something don't know. I made that something really day. abstract. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm wondering, where was he? Yeah, I guess we'll never know. Cuts to him in an alleyway. <laughs> blood on his mouth. <laughs> Ten years old. <laughs> <clears throat> you strike me You strike me as having a little resistance of, of, of um, speaking certain specific facts about your life online. Mm-hmm. Possibly in an attempt to keep your hyper real projection separate from your real self. Right. Or do you view that as the same thing? There's no, there's no distinction between who you are online and who you are in real life. I think there's a distinction. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, when my audience, they'll, they'll do like a, I mean, and you've also assigned me like a Myers-Briggs, uh, uh, traits and stuff like that. My mm. audience has also, oh, wait, what's I, your, what's your Myers-Briggs? I've, I've actually, well, I remember I I've actually gone back on this and they were all like, a, I really don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't think you fit neatly into any MBTI. I yeah. think MBTI only works when someone's a really extreme example of their type. So when someone's like very extroverted and like very <laughs> intuitive and like, you know, very feely, very yeah. judgy. I mean, that's what I was saying about like the, the big five, because the big five is like a trait based spectrum. Whereas like uh, the problem with Myers-Briggs is it's like typology. It's like there's types. Right. So there's a lot of like kind of like there are there are people that are obviously going to identify with their it's a bit like astrology. They're going to identify with those types and they're going to be the most outspoken. And then they'll take that as evidence. Right. No, yeah. for sure. And I, I mostly agree with you. I think big five is, is generally better. But when someone falls really neatly into all those types, mm-hmm. you have a secondary part of Myers-Briggs called cognitive functions. Mm. And then that when you get into that, it's like it, it is very interesting to see what's your strongest trait and then what's your weakest trait. Um, mm-hmm. But it only works for people who are extreme examples of the type and who are, uh, are sometimes kind of like archetypal or stereotypical people in some ways. Um, but yeah. What's yours? Uh, the internet says I'm an ENTP. ENTP. Yeah, but they, they but then they don't know if I'm an ENTP or an INFP. Like like most people say ENTP. Some people say INFP because I'm depressed. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, weird. We're like the same because I'm ENTJ. 
No, we're like ENTJ is pretty different from ENTP. Is it? Yeah. Oh, they said they're, yeah, they share, yeah, they share yeah, so the, many letters. The, the J type, <laughs> the, the P versus J dichotomy is the most important dichotomy. Okay. So basically, and this is, this comes out, I'm like more spontaneous. You like planning. Yeah. So we're a good balance for each other. Cause you were trying to like make everything about this podcast. Perfect. And mm-hmm. I was just like, let's just get it out. And now we have a pretty good setup, but we're still doing it, even though it's not ideal circumstances. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this is a good setup. And this is your first one too. Yeah, if, if it was if it was up to me, uh, oh, we would be crowding around a webcam. <laughs> yeah, no, <I> know. <laughs> so that's what that's what our chat is doing for me. Right Probably now. get more views as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I I, uh, I um I let I let our chat do his do his thing, do his visionary right. stuff because I need some vision in my life. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about DID? You see, you, oh yeah, that, no, that just, came right to your head when you were like DSM. Well, it's really interesting because you see it like portrayed in media a lot, but it's like not a very common disorder. And then there was like controversy, um, I think, in the 80s where a lot of people were saying like, oh, it's actually therapists are are learning about DID from other sources. And they're like in they're kind of like leading the patient on into Hmm. into confirming to certain like diagnoses. Hmm. Um, But then, I mean, there are genuine cases of people in like fugue states and stuff like that. And it it does seem to be like a a genuine disorder. Um, it was like a little while ago I got really into researching it just like while I was in university. But um, yeah, I just find it interesting because it, it kind of raises so many questions about like identity and, um, you know, the fact that they can sometimes be aware of their host identity and their like alter and stuff like that. Like, yeah, they, they can. But they're they're like they just see them as distinct and there, there's no sort of uh, dissonance. Have you ever heard crazy. of a tulpa? A tulpa? Yeah. So there's this subreddit called our tulpa. And basically <clears> they're people who try to make an alternate identity in their head intentionally. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people claim that they've done it. They like sit down and they give them an, they give it a name. They give it like personality. They like actively stew on it. And then there's like these Reddit posts of like, I just talked to my Tulpa for the first time and he said this and I'm so excited. And like, this is a good thing. There's like, like, a, like an imaginary friend. Yeah, of sort of. Like, but okay. it's it, like, like method like, acting. I guess. But some of these people actually clearly have disassociative identity disorder. Mm. And some of these people maybe don't but mm-hmm. have convinced themselves they do and what's the difference hmm yeah it would be i don't i don't know it would be cool to talk to like an expert on it or like uh, somebody that's maybe experiencing it i'm going to get some tulpas on the pod get some tulpas <laughs> yeah get yeah. some tulpas on the pod well what, what about I, I was once accused of being plural phobic because i i made a joke about like my the center side characters being tulpas yeah um so, so what's plural phobic plural phobic is when you are a you know, like being biased against people with disassociative identity or like people with tulpas, basically. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. There's a whole, there's That's a, whole, a real term. Yeah. Plural phobic. Cause That's like insane. they're like they, them, but because they have five people inside of them. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Well, what, about, okay. What about, cause when I think DID, I think about like the internet, I think about like TikTok people where they're where they're where their altered characters are like anime characters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like that's, I made like a video a while ago on just like a, psychological disorders and a lot of the comments were just like oh like everyone on tiktok's gonna like run with these like you're just you just taught like everyone on tiktok all these like new disorders that they can like because that is a, a a thing you see because i think it's like it skews towards a younger audience on tiktok and i think in part of like forming their identities they uh they want to find like unique specific like like you know disorders or, or just like yeah. identities that they can like hold on to um, I kind of feel like it's old man behavior to not let them have that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that they can't have that. But. I think that's an essential part of, of being young is you have all these mm-hmm. fun toys and you're like, you know, DID, autism, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? I just think that the difference is that Nazbol, <laughs> the difference is now they have power, right? It's like, I think, I think before that makes sense to, to be really open and experimental when you're a teenager, but now it's like, I identify as, as, as DID and DID makes me like a special protected class. Like it's no longer like I'm being an open artistic mm-hmm. child. I'm like, I'm now, I'm now, because I say I am this thing, I'm like a protected class. I have like therapy, medication. I'm part of like this world now. You know what I mean? It's, it's, that's what's weird to me. I'm, I'm pro societal destruction, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> well, I, I, I was talking to Lily Alexander, who's this YouTuber in Montreal, and she did like a pretty good video essay on, I forget what it's called, but like, uh, couple like i'd say almost like a decade ago on on tumblr they had these communities of people that were like heavily invested in i don't think it was specifically neo pronouns but they were like young people that were like coming up with like new gender identities like just just like an infinite list of gender identities 
And I think she kind of tackled it in terms of like, yes, there was some, I guess, you know, the, the way that it was kind of uh, presenting trans identities and like, like to other people is like, I think it might've added to the absurdity. And so people that were already kind of transphobic or like skeptical of it, they kind of like looked at these communities as like being, you know, evidence of that. But then overall, I think her argument was just like, it's like kind of a, just a necessary thing that like society just kind of has to accept is that like young people are going to find different ways to like identify. And it's probably going to like look naive to older people, but it's like overall fairly harm harmless, I guess. But. Yeah. I th I think I, I think that it's harmful, and that's exactly why they should do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're I think you're, there will get to the point where you can identify as anything you want, and then transhumanly modify your body into actually being that thing. You can identify as a dragon and become a dragon or something, and that's it. And that's a good thing, right? It is genuinely yeah. a good thing because it's more fun that way. What do you think of my shirt, Sisyphus? NRA. <laughs> yeah. What do you? What do you <laughs> right, let me just turn where around. Did you, where did you get that? Uh, oh. That's not important. What do you think about the back of the shirt? <laughs> Don't tread on my right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let, me, let me just show this off to the camera here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sent, sent by a friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> friend of the show who? I don't know. Just some... Is this the my, first episode? It showed up... <laughs> <laughs> friend of my, I, I'm, I'm friends with myself. <laughs> the show has one friend, and it's a guy who sent us an, an NRA shirt. Yeah. Uh, it just showed up my P.O. box one day. Okay. So, yeah. That's interesting. Are you a uh, pro... Um, pro gun rights or no? I didn't think this far. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to have this conversation. Probably should have worn the shirt. That's, yeah. that, that's your one question. Yeah, Just, I was like, oh, I really hope no one asks me about gun rights. Yeah, I think I'm pro. <laughs> I, I think I think from an extremist perspective, it makes sense to be pro gun rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I'm a centrist right now, so I'm anti gun rights. So the centrist position? Yeah, yeah. Status quo is kind of like like maybe for hunting. Okay. Yeah, mm. that's fair. Not really, but. Well, <laughs> status quo also depends on where you are. Like a Canadian status quo firearm position is only for hunting. Yeah. But in America, it's different. Yeah. Culture's different. Yeah. I know. That's why it's, it's gun rights arguments are so funny when it's like Canadians and versus Americans. Because in America, it's baked into the culture. It's like part. It's so deeply ingrained in the culture. And in Canada, it just isn't. So it's like mm. not the same at all. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't feel like you're talking to like the, the like the same person or like speaking the same language. Yeah, you're like a Canadian mm -hmm. talking to an American about gun rights because yeah. they, they have to acknowledge that entire like it's a constitutional uh, like part of their identity. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think that's why because it's when people always use like examples of Australia or like all these gun buyback programs that have worked. It just wouldn't work for the states. Like I think America is like the exception. It wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. It would be bad, like net negative for the states to try to like take guns away. Mm -hmm. Only for the states. Mm. I think in other countries it would work great, but not for not for the U.S. Yes. I, I have a video. I have a video on like how to stop gun violence? Question mark. And then it's just like I don't know. And I'm like looking at stats. I'm like, oh, interesting, huh? Looking at like gun violence. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, stats. I'm like, oh, weird, huh? And I'm like, okay, huh, cool. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm from I'm from Canada. I mean, this is kind of, like, the, the, actually, the title is like, how do you stop gun violence in America? Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, I don't know, I'm from Canada. It's a weird question to ask me. I thought I was talking to an American friend and they literally said like, um, I thought they were making a joke that there was a, a shooting in a Walmart in Florida city. And I thought that that was just like a, like sh they just found the most generic kind of just like a example of like a American violence. I didn't mm -hmm. know Florida city existed. Florida mm -hmm. city And then just exists. the fact that it was in, yeah, I guess so. And then, I mean, maybe it doesn't, maybe it was a joke, but that's the, maybe that's the problem. Florida I couldn't city. tell if it was a joke. If we don't not. know that Florida city is a real place or not. <laughs> yeah. The Walmart in Florida city. I feel like it could be. We're going to find a that out right now. in a Walmart in Florida we're gonna, city. Like I just, I don't know. We're going to find that out right now on the pod. Yeah. Florida city, city in Florida. Wow. If you believe it. <laughs> it's great. It sounds like an AI generated American headline. <laughs> Geographically, where is it? Um, major city that's close to. Oh man. Uh, first of all, I would say that the population is 12,000 people. Okay. So. Not not huge. Close to Jacksonville. It's close to Miami. Close to Miami. Yeah. So it's on the okay. Hmm. So it's on the Atlantic coast, not the Gulf Coast. You know more about geography than me. <laughs> I just know about the funny political blobs. <laughs> that's that's my thing. Um, ever tried any medication? Uh, no, no. I mean, like, uh, I'm on a uh, asthma inhaler. <laughs> I guess it's too bad. It's too late. Since this has gone woke. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As with steroids, as inhalers are, ste yeah, are steroids. Yeah, steroids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get roided out. Mm -hmm. 
That's why you get that big bicep vein. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think about nihilism? What do I think about nihilism? A lot of people ask about that. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, I think that there's like, I think the the honest way of looking at it is that it's like a metaphysical stance that some people hold mm. where it's like nothing has any inherent value um and like that's it pretty much like there's mm -hmm. actually no such thing as meaning or just and like and then you can like and then you could make like ethical arguments after that so like existentialists are like well you can make your own meaning absurdists would be like the meaning is created through revolting against the nihilism mm -hmm. um but like I don't know. And I guess there's people that that would self-identify as nihilists. And I, I just kind of like struggle with that a little bit. I, I don't really understand. But um, I guess like, uh, I don't know, like accelerationism or like doomerism, mm. like that kind of stuff where you're kind of being self-destructive in a way. But I still feel like that's still making an ethical stance and you're still kind of saying in a way that there's like, this is meaningful. Or mm. else like, why wouldn't they do it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Did you pop out of the womb with values? Um, I, I mean, I think that you're, you're, when you're bored, there's like, you're socialized into certain things really early on, mm -hmm. but I don't think I had, I think compared to other people, I didn't have very like strong values towards things. Like I wasn't brought up in a religious, uh, household mm -hmm. or like, uh, you know, my parents weren't like overly like political with me mm -hmm. with, with about anything in particular, but I, it was a more like conservative environment that I would have grown up in just like being in Alberta. I feel like nihilism today is kind of lame. It reminds me of like modern day Satanism. Modern day Satanism is just wrecking Christians with facts and logic mm -hmm. and they like uh, uh, in inevitably go to, you know, liberal humanism, but they actually don't sacrifice babies and drink their blood. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what's uh, like. If you're a, like, a true Satanist, that's what you should be doing. <laughs> yeah. You want to get into the constructive like uh, like actions. Yeah. Like, not just not just self critique. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like right now, Satanism is just anti like kind of like like we're getting get we're like actually all atheists. Mm -hmm. we're not actually worshiping satan yeah i mean it just seems, seems kind of lame it's like if you're a nihilist today you should kill yourself and everybody else yeah but that in itself is already like well you're kind of saying something like you're, right. you're kind of saying like you should just not do anything you like, should just like <laughs> you should just, i don't i don't know like so in that way like a lot of liberal humanists are acting out nihilist values wait, wait, what's that chinese term lie down and rot. like yeah we were we were talking about uh, the one one person in our live stream yesterday by by Lan, which is the lying flat movement in China, mm -hmm. doesn't that strike you as nihilist? Yeah, I'd say that's that's probably the most honest uh, attempt at like being nihilistic. But you're still trying to do something. I mean, there's like active mm -hmm. versus passive nihilism as well. Yes, yeah. Nietzsche is kind of a and, and active would just be kind of like a. I think that's just existentialism. Like that's proto existentialism. Yeah. Um, and passive is lying flat. Passive is, I think, him kind of talking about Schopenhauer and Schopenhauer's interpretation of kind That's of the like problem Buddhism. with philosophers right here. <laughs> as soon as a philosopher starts building upon the ideas of another philosopher, because like a philosopher plucks these ideas from the aether and then they already have flaws in them. And then we build upon the flaws so that they have like kind of a rotten foundation. Yeah. And then we're getting further and further from the truth <laughs> as we think we're getting deeper and deeper into it because they have autism. That's this is a this is an autism thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Spinoza was just self-referential. He didn't I don't think he built on anybody. Spinoza was just thinking. Yeah. I like philosophers yeah. to just fucking think. Yeah. yeah. Get yeah. their ideas out there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I feel like nihilism, nihilism makes less and less sense. I think people are realizing that. Like, people are, like more and more people are becoming religious. Mm -hmm. And religious in like a real sense. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just, I think things are, things have meaning. It's like, even if you, if you take the argument, like, of the universe just operating on its own without human consciousness, it still can't be observed because there's no consciousness to observe it. So, like, we have consciousness and then, the vessel that has consciousness also assigns things meaning. Like when I see a baby, I feel something and I feel something cause it's like built in me to feel something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel anything when you look at a baby, you don't feel like love. You don't feel like you well up a little bit inside when you see like a baby in a stroller. Yeah. Like a happy family. Yeah. Like um, do, do you feel like a little warm when you see like I have a family? Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, some people absolutely hate babies. There's a lot of like, anti-natalists uh, and like. I, uh, I, I think I think you're just like you're just like a warm future father, <laughs> and with like a lot of love for the family unit because that's eventually what you're gonna have. You're gonna have the ten kids. Yeah, because there is it is, it's a similar argument made by like uh, people that are really religious and they're like why atheism is wrong and it's like the sentimentality argument, which I, I know like the the atheism movement 
they they always dog on and like i get it because like i do i know what you mean like like there's certain things in life where it, like it seems like they're they justify existence and meaning just by being yeah um but it's hard because it's a, it's a sentimental argument so it's like if somebody else just doesn't feel that does that just mean then that like your argument's wrong or is there something kind of pathological about it means, it means they're broken it means they're broken it means they're broken people <laughs> <laughs> okay give yourself a percentage chance that you're gonna have kids in the future Mm-hmm. Based off everything you know about yourself right now, I'd say like uh, I don't know, seventy, seventy percent. What about you? Like hundred, hundred and ten, <laughs> hundred and ten. Does that just mean you already have kids? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like the only the only way of justifying that answer. Ninety five. My 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 dark ending is just like red pill. Right. That's mm-hmm. I, we, yeah yeah. But that's an interesting. I want to ask you about that. Like with with antinatalism. Like how do you how do you actually justify having kids if you're somebody that's like a you know, more skeptical and like cynic- cynical about like uh, the direction of the world mm. and like because it is an ethical argument of bringing life into a world that might not for sure. Antinatalism is like inherently in a kind of an apocalyptic argument. Mm-hmm. It's like the world is ending, but it's also like a Malthusian argument as well, mm-hmm. which is that like there's just not enough food and my you know, my kids will have a terrible life and you know I had a terrible life. That's often yeah, that's yeah. often what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I, I strongly disagree. I can feel Brogan welling up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I'm working on a video on antinatalism, and I'm, right. I've I've put it on a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And basically, like on on one side of the spectrum, you have like um, people who choose antinatalism for themselves, like I don't want to have kids. People on are child free, and then you go further, and then you have like people making ethical arguments with that's like actual antinatalism, mm-hmm. and then you have like the voluntary human extinction movement, mm-hmm. which says we should all stop having kids right now, and like we all need to die. Uh, and then you have you have kind of like push that even further. You get uh, there's a small community on Reddit called Ethilism, which is life backwards. They say like all conscious life was a mistake. All animals, plants, everything should die right mm-hmm. now. We should kill it. And it's a little facetious, a little, little ironic, but a little post ironic as well. Like one of the uh, one of the posts on Ethilism recently was. Um, you know, humans are causing the greatest uh, anthropos like you know extinction event known to man, or like whatever it's in in history. Mm-hmm. And the comments are all like, "Another W." <laughs> it seems like a cope a bit, yeah, but yeah. but then you go in the other direction, you get to like forced birth, or as some would say, modern day America. Nice, <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> ladies. Instagram DMs open. <laughs> oh, um, thirty percent. By the way. That's your that's your percentage, twenty five to thirty. Twenty five to thirty. Yeah, I don't know. I just think people should have kids. Kids are great. Families are great. Families pa- and kids. I I would feel kind of weird about passing down psychosis to my child. You, you like you've made it. See, this is like my argument. Though, is you made it this far, uh-huh. and you like you. I see you express pride in yourself i see you express hope in your future i see you express love for those around you right for your family and your friends you have a good life and you enjoy being alive in some sense uh-huh. why would your child not just right. based on this abstract perception of your own shortcomings why would your <laughs> child be an extreme version of that our chat is betting on on the good in me and i love to see it <laughs> but i think like ethically somebody that 30 percent wants to have kids like shouldn't have kids like those kids aren't going to be like loved very much probably i'm not saying i 30 percent want to have kids i'm saying like ethically like like just logically there's about a 30 percent chance it'll happen oh a thir- oh like there's other you're, yeah a lot of variables yeah okay i see i could die tomorrow <laughs> i could die i could die in, in five months right five more months <laughs> five more months um i don't i don't i don't know i think nobody I, I think you'd like you have kids and your perspective changes when you have children. Yeah. For some people, it I doesn't. Know. I totally know there's like there's people out there who like have children and hate the fact they had children and resent their children and their children yeah. become fucked up. But it's still like even if you think you don't want kids or if you're like, oh, I'm uh, I'm irresponsible or like I want my life to be more free. Like and then you give that up for like the meaning of having a child and like caring for a family. You're going to get something from it. You're going to love your child. It's like within you to love your child. I was talking to JJ about this this morning. And he, uh, Who, who's JJ, JJ McCullough, okay. my friend and mentor who I disagree with on every political point. <laughs> um, and he was like, he was just, <laughs> we were just talking about like animal rights. And he was like, I, cause I bought some meat and he was, he was saying animals, you shouldn't eat meat. I was like, JJ, why do you care? Like, you don't think animals have any feelings or emotions. And, uh, it's true. He doesn't, he doesn't believe this. Um, and he was like, uh, 
he was basically saying, well, you know, I, I, I was, I was basically trying to convince him like animals feel pain, obviously. And like, you know, there's, there's a through line between animal reactions and our reactions. Like we obviously evolved from animals. So, and he, and he said, yeah, but animals eat their kids. Dogs will eat their kids. So we're not dogs. <laughs> I was like, I could eat my kid. <laughs> I could do a Kronos. <laughs> oh man. I watched, a, I watched a video on, Infan on infanticide actually. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You told me about it. You were <laughs> affected by it greatly. <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally affected you negatively, right? Um, no, not really. No, I, yeah, well, I, I, it, it made sense. It? it made sense. Yeah, infanticide. Yeah, I mean, it made right. sense that animals do it because they don't. They don't have like lore. Animals don't have like belief structures and like, and, like myths <laughs> that like. A lot of animals eat their kids. <laughs> Lack of lore. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have. They don't have collective myths that like unite them. Right. That's why humans don't eat their kids. Like, we have all these things that abstract us from our human nature. I guess. That's why I hate the red pill, because they're like, we have to keep stripping away until we're at our, like, our rawest, most hierarchical form. It's like, no, no, you, right. don't, you don't want that. And that hierarchical form is just what they invented in their head. Yeah. Like, via some evolutionary biology. But even if it wasn't, even if they if they're actually genuinely believe, like, oh, we should get back to, like, 20,000 years ago. We should get back to before there, were, like, before there was language, like, when we were monkeys. That's how humans should behave, and everything from that is an abstraction. Mm. It's like, you, you would, like... You look at your baby like you'd have like twins and one of them is like missing a finger. You like throw it on a fucking wall mm. immediately when it came out. Red pill Sisyphus, how many plates you spin in 55? <laughs> um, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard of the term spinning plates? No. It's how many girls you got going on the... Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, obviously not a lot then if that's... A, mm. I don't know. I don't mm. know what that means. Um. <laughs> Sisyphus, Sisyphus, pleading ignorance. Yeah, <laughs> that's the question. Is what how, what how what are you <laughs> what, what knowledge would you give up right now? Would you exile from <laughs> your brain? <laughs> what knowledge would I give up? I'll give you my answer. I wish I never found out about accelerationism. I, I think I think viewing humans as a process has been poisonous to my mind. Mm. Hmm. I guess there's like certain medical facts I wish I didn't know because it kind of freaks me out. Don't say them. Yeah, and I won't. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> you hinted them. <sighs> No, I don't, I don't even want to mention it. Like, it's just actually really nasty. It involves kidney stones and, like, mm. another specific... Uh, oh, I thought you... In, in combination. Yeah. I thought it was going to be, like, a scary death one. No, no, no. Oh, that's fine. No. As long as I don't die. <laughs> I mean, you could die from this if you don't get it treated. But nothing, like, I guess, intellectual. You mm. know, I think it's important to, like, to know... To just continually, like, know about more and more ideologies and then see if, like... Mm. see like what works what doesn't i really work like what it. you said um your why you're not killing yourself answer although it was still overly abstract <laughs> um that you said like it was kind of like passion like mm -hmm. and um when I, I wake up i have my call with jj and he just said something wrong and i immediately like personalize <laughs> like i wake up and i'm just like a formless void of thoughts and i'm just thinking about like dying mm -hmm. and then i like, call from jj and i'm like uh what He's like, Craig, I've just been walking around. I've been thinking. I'm like, no, you're wrong. I get up and I get like, I'm on my feet and I'm just like pacing around my house doing my laundry and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's that does it for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just like reminding myself who I am. My ego. I have to like get back into that thing. It's good. I like my ego. I do like my ego. Oh, it's just, um, you know, sometimes I, I slip out of it and I'm like, oh, I got to get back in this thing and be who I am. <laughs> it's like a cocoon. <laughs> yeah. A slimy cocoon. It's like it's like it's like a wet sock. I actually had this uh, experience once coming down from mushrooms my ego was putting like getting put back into my body and like it felt like putting on a wet sock i was like i don't want to put this back on Ugh, felt gross wait sorry this is unrelated but can you make the thumbnail like that that meme of like those three like 12 year old kids <laughs> just talking to each other yeah that would that'd be good <laughs> ego putting on a wet sock that's a good analogy mm -hmm. yeah that's a good analogy i have uh, yeah I, I feel like yeah I've, I've been there i know what you mean i know what you mean I've thought about that with other people's egos and like group egos, group identity. Also, for the record, I'm not schizophrenic because I, I did uh, mushrooms or LSD. I was always like that. Want to make that specific. Want to make that clear. <laughs> You're not schizophrenic because... I'm just like naturally psycho like schizotypal. I'm not... Uh, it's not because I did too much mushrooms. Oh, okay. It's just, that's just, that, 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 those people aren't real. <sighs> I know. I those people don't, go, don't get the schizotypal card. I'm, I'm gatekeeping schizophrenia. You should. I hate that argument. Yeah. I hate the, the anti-mushroom... Actually, it's funny. It's funny watching the red pill become like anti anti psychedelics. I think it like bleeds Are in. Anti psychedelic though. Yeah, they'll talk about like because they're anti weed, mm. and then they're like anything anything that disrupts your path to power. Right. In any way. That's, that's shape, why or you should only take bad. stimulants. Would you like uh, capitalism gum, Sisyphus? Delicious capitalism gum. 
if you want, I can. This, I four, it's four milligrams of nicotine. <laughs> what is this actually? It's four milligrams of nicotine. No. Are you I'm sure? Okay. I, I, can I don't bite do off, any sort of I, nicotine. I can bite off half of it for you. You'll <laughs> I'm feel okay. so I'm really, really fine. The tramp fucking nicotine lozenge. <laughs> 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 I'm fine. No, that's okay. <laughs> oh my god. Um. Yeah. No. They're like anything. Yeah. Any, anything that disrupts you. From your path to power. We're going to get more and more stimulated on either side of him. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great sports Sisyphus. I appreciate you. Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me. Um, I, yeah. Pro mushroom or anti mushroom? Do you think everyone should take mushrooms? I don't think everyone should take mushrooms. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I, I guess I'd be pro. Like the world would be a better place if more people took mushrooms once. Probably. I've met a lot of people that have done psychedelics and they, they tell me that they've really like they see everything differently now and they're still just kind of the same person. Mm. I haven't actually seen any sort of genuine. And I think it's it's, you know, it's a boring answer, but I think paired with like, you know, a healthier lifestyle therapy, therapy. some form of like mindfulness practice mm. like, uh, you know, it's it's not like a, a it'll fix absolutely everything. Mm. You need to like genuinely like do like a bunch of other things in tandem with it, but it does free up like uh, cognitive resources, like, and like, I guess like it specifically challenging, like the default mode network um, mm. in, in a way that like other techniques don't really do. Mm. In simplest terms, what has therapy done for you? Oh, I mean like, uh, I think therapy's helped a lot in the sense that I think just first of all, day to day, it gives me the uh, space to just, articulate my emotions or like tough emotional situations um that like i think could sometimes be taxing if i was like constantly talking to my friends or family about it like it's good that there's just kind of like an objective like listener but then also sometimes you could just use therapy just to kind of justify your own like feelings mm -hmm. and it's also nice that they can kind of challenge you a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. you end up like learning from it and then specifically i was doing like a i'm still doing like a like schema therapy mm -hmm. which is like really breaking down the kind of like myths or stories you have of yourself and kind of, uh, you know, really figuring out like how they match with your behavior. Where did they come from? Like, are they, which aspects of them are useful and which are not useful. Mm. Um, so I think in a lot of ways it's, it's helped quite a bit, like in terms of just, I just feel happier and a bit more like sure of who I am and, and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah. Is schema therapy an actual like, um, yeah, I haven't heard of that one. That's yeah. interesting. Is it the same as like uh, CBT? It's always cool yeah, learning it's, about it's a new. It's considered like I mean, kind. it uses aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy and also like I guess like acceptance commitment therapy, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, I think it's like I don't know Beck or something like they're the ones that first developed it, but yeah, it, it talks about like there's defectiveness, there's um, perfectionism, emotional inhibition, hmm. um, kind of this. Uh, catastrophizing or like vulnerability where like you think like outside events are going to always happen to you or you think that like you'll do something really bad mm -hmm. um so these are things that a lot of people just have and they're just like they're developed in like usually childhood um and they guide most of our behavior is kind of the argument mm -hmm. so just 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 accepting them and kind of knowing about them is already like most of the battle mm -hmm. what's your guiding negative trait like what's your what's your achilles heel probably probably i think his, historically um kind of a urge to have some sort of validation from like other people or like external validation mm. um i think because that has led me into ignoring other parts of uh or other like people in my life or just aspects of my life that would have actually been more like fulfilling in the search for like kind of that that challenge of like getting like attention or getting like um you know validation from like other people yeah so, yeah hmm interesting yeah i feel like that's a lot of people i feel like that's me i feel that i think anybody on youtube probably has that a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i think yeah. if i think uh, i'm i would agree that everyone on youtube has some kind of mental disorder for sure <laughs> uh i mean no one posting online is doing it out of like mental healthiness well there's like some level of entitlement to the idea that our uh whatever we say is like uh attention worthy or like should should be listened to or something because most people don't really have credentials uh when talking about these things like um you know i only have my undergraduate degree and uh there's no level of expertise <laughs> that i can genuinely sign off on what's up horseshoe theory nation clip this and put it on tiktok <laughs> right now you know, Brogan's, uh, Archad's 
TikTok of us on the fake podcast. I did it's see that. Most yes. viewed TikTok. Oh, it, was, nice. it's my, it was my most viewed TikTok. It was, it was very well edited. But it's just like it's a fake TikTok. It's just nonsense. Yeah. it's actual just nonsense. I think we should just make that a whole series of us just talking in algo speak. <laughs> Yeah, you have to find us new algo speak terms. Okay. And then just feed it to us. I'll hunt for them. Yeah. <laughs> oh my fucking god. Yeah, I, I was like, I was so pissed. I had like 12, 1200 views this morning. I was like, why would anyone? Like just scrolling, <laughs> that comes up on TikTok. Yeah, I guess because it just really like fits with the rest of the stuff people would see. Yeah, it looks like, exactly. oh yeah, this makes sense. I don't know what they're yeah. talking about, but it makes sense. The form is there. Yeah, the form is there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how I always think, I've been really, we've been doing the studio mm-hmm. and I've been really excited about just like being around a lot of talent and it's, it's, it's very cool. And then I'll talk to somebody I, I just outside of this space entirely. I'll be like, Oh, do you know, like this person, like we've been working with recently and they have no idea who I'm talking about anybody mm-hmm. who, I'm, who I'm talking about. And I was talking to like, uh, someone I'm seeing as I asked him if they wanted to come over and I was like, you want to wake up and like meet a bunch of famous YouTubers? And she's like, not at all. Yeah, that's fair. That was her. That, that was sounds her, terrifying. I know. I was, <laughs> that, does, that doesn't sound very fun. I thought it'd be fun. I thought it'd sound like no. great. <laughs> She'd be like, yeah, I'm just like super excited. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, nothing. So I think, yeah, you do. Lead. I think people even see YouTubers as mentally ill. Mm-hmm. It's not just like a lot of them are mentally ill. It's like normal people are like, oh, that whole, that whole cast of, mm. of character, that whole cast of career is just like, I write them off as people I don't trust. I think there might be a like a genuine and maybe even like a justifiable defense mechanism that gets pushed up against that kind of well, people yeah. of clout. Yeah. And that's why POCs, people of clout, are the most persecuted <laughs> minority. <laughs> Sisyphus, could we get you in front of the camera, biting your lip? No. <laughs> <laughs> why? I want to I see it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. You should do it. <laughs> You've done it before. I just, I just want to, I just want to see it again. <laughs> what, if, what have I done? It? <laughs> we were hanging out, and you, you were biting your lip and doing this. I was smoldering. Yeah, you were I smoldering at me. Now remember, I was like, this face should not be making this expression. <laughs> <laughs> Can we? Yeah. If you do that, I mean, that would be a perfect thumbnail. I can't. I can't. That's like. <laughs> You did it. You did okay. I, what I'll say is, yeah. you did it, and I've seen a lot of smolders. Mm-hmm. You did it better than any. Uh, like it was the. It was perfect. No. Oh. Well, thank you. Yeah. I guess I mean, it has to be natural, though. It can't be. Uh, you know, that's can't a, be performed. It was performative. That it was all so good. <laughs> Wait, was it actually? Yeah, yeah. You were like, you, you did it like five times. Oh, was I was like making fun of something. Or was yeah, like you were like doing it vaguely, ironically. That's a judge. If someone does that, I'm not going to trust any words that come out of their mouth. Yeah, I feel like this would really make people not want to watch the. If I, went to, if I went to, like, a guy's Instagram and hit a photo, like, a selfie of him like that, Smolder. Smolder, <laughs> yeah. I would not, I'd write him off. Like, every word, I would just laugh. Whatever, whatever, whatever he said, I'd just be like, ha, like, walk away. <laughs> Damn. I wish I had Google Glass, and I was recording my entire life, and I could just pull that moment up. <laughs> well, it's, so, it's so ingrained into my memory I for do, some when reason. was this? I don't remember. I don't know. Like... We were hanging out at some point, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> I forget how it came up. <laughs> Oh, I mean, like, I can do a very, uh, I've been told I can do a very good, like, kind of frat boy, like, fuck boy impression. Um, impression. Impression, yeah, impression. because that's not actually what I am, for sure. <laughs> you got um, that in you. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a period of my life where I was uh, a mess and um, probably identified with, with that role a lot more. But I'd like to think that that's not really, a, you know, who I am, but who are I used you? to say I'm Ben. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Yeah, because no, you I know too many Bens, so yeah, I've been yeah. calling him Sisyphus 55 for, like, what, three years? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Every phone call. Sisyphus spins 55 plates. 55. Mm, gives 55 women syphilis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I still have all of the, you guys guessing what the 55 is on the, the chalkboard in my apartment, so... Mm. Have you ever revealed publicly what the 55 was? No, I got asked on another podcast what that was, and I still haven't. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's mm. like, oh, there's a meeting. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it was a crazy meeting. <laughs> maybe. It, it blew my mind when he, when he told <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, I've never told him. I'm sure it, it would have. Te- <laughs> yeah. Teared up. There's no meaning. Whenever someone's like, uh, oh, yeah, it's a crazy meeting, but I'm not going to tell you. I've never told anyone. It's because there's no meaning. Yeah, that can be some like 4D chess, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could be. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be. Yeah, no, it could be for sure. For uh, sure. Um, how do we want to end these things? How do we want to end the podcast? Yeah. We should just be in the death. 
Uh, yeah, I just pull a gun out. Like, <laughs> fake, fake, kill you. Yeah, you can. Can you like edit us? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a good. Or, like just like a really shitty like one of those like like those like you get like phone apps or like the fighter jet comes in. And bombs, like, the... <laughs> that th- that'd be a good shtick though. Actually, like. As soon as there's like you can tell when the conversation like it's reached its, its narrative apex, its, mm-hmm. its narrative epilogue, right? It starts to fizzle out. And as soon as I sense like I just sense it, mm-hmm. and as soon as there's like a four second pause, I just like I keep a gun like a fake <laughs> like a fake gun here, right? And I just like do that and yeah. then edit it so it, like goes to black, like, yeah. like you die and it goes to black, and that's yeah, how like, every every podcast ends. Gunshot one frame of his brains. <laughs> <And then laughs> it's definitely monitored. 